So um, again, want to just thank everybody for being here. Uh, this webinar this morning is the first in a series, and this is really professional development events that we're working on as part of a um, is part of a Southern Sarah grant, but it's really to support the Kentucky ag professionals. So that's why, you know, this content is really not for growers, but it's really for the professionals like us who support growers. Um, and we also want to create this specialty crop sustainable production community of practice where we can really learn from each other and share resources and, and share information. And I want to give a real shout out to, to our partners here. And I, I guess I know most of the people on the call, but for those of you who I haven't worked with before, I'm Cindy Finiseth with the Kentucky Hort Council. And I want to shout out to our uh, partners who are, who are on the call and helping with this, this grant project that we have going. Um, and at any time, if you have questions about the project, feel free to reach out. Um, the University of Kentucky Center for Crop Diversification, we've got Josh Knight on here, and then also the Organic Association of Kentucky. So we have um, a couple of folks there. Um, you're going to hear from Brooke Gentile in just a little bit. And then um, super shout out to Jenny, who's handling some of our tech stuff today with, with Oak. So you've heard enough from me, you want to get into the real meat, so I want to turn it over to Brooke to introduce our speaker for today. Hey there, um, thanks so much Cindy, um, super excited to get started today, great to, to see you all here today. I'm Brooke Gentile with the Organic Association of Kentucky, um, and I have the honor of introducing um, Sonia Keith, who's with us today. Um, let me go ahead and add, add her to the spotlight too here. There she is. Um, so uh, we have the, the great opportunity to hear from Sonia about a lot of NRCS programs today. So thanks for tuning in. Um, we'll explore when and how we can help farmers address resource concerns on their farm. Um, so Sonia Keith is the Assistant State Conservationist and Partnership Coordinator with the Kentucky State Office here. Um, she's in Lexington. Are you in Lexington, Sonia? Do you live in Lexington? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and works all over the state. Um, and uh, she has a great program lined up and we'll be dropping lots of links in the chat for you all today. Um, and we'll send out a sort of a summary email too with a recording and links that are that come through as well. Um, so Sonia, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. So you guys can still hear me, right? And you can still see my screen. Is that okay? Do I need to do anything to it? Looks Good. great. Okay. Yeah. All right. So thanks to everybody for being here. Um, of course, I had technical difficulties when I first signed on. So I'm on my phone and on my computer at the same time. So hopefully everything will work out okay. Um, as Brooke mentioned, my name is Sonia Keith and I work for the Natural Resources Conservation Service. I'm in the state office um, and I'm the partnership coordinator there. I do live in Midway, Kentucky, which is a little bit outside of Lexington, but um, enjoy, enjoy my work. Uh, my background is actually in engineering. I have a degree in agriculture engineering and I've worked with NRCS for years in, in, in that engineering capacity. And about three years ago, I got the partnership coordinator job. So I get to do stuff like this. Um, you know, pre-COVID, I used to do stuff like this in person, which was a little more fun, but this is, at least we have the technology to still get the word out and do things um, in this capacity. So what I'm excited to share with you and what I share with a lot of people across the state is just some background information about the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And for you all specifically, because so many of our clientele kind of overlap, if you're working with people um, in your respective areas and you think may, maybe NRCS might be able to assist them, I'm going to go over kind of what we do, how we do it, how to get in touch with us, that sort of thing. So it maybe will assist you in knowing kind of where to direct people. Um, we rely on extension agents and other partners heavily to kind of send people our way. We get a lot of good outreach from, from other partners across the state. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, so first, just a little bit of background. The Natural Resources Conservation Service has been around since 1935. We were founded directly as a result of the Dust Bowl. So if you want to talk about a gigantic man-made disaster resulting in a horrible lack of taking care of natural resources, just look up the Dust Bowl and see how all that happened. Um, 
our father of conservation, Hugh Hammond Bennett, kind of the guy who founded the agency, he actually predicted in like 1905 that the ag practices that we were doing, particularly out in the western part of the United States, were not sustainable, that we were not taking care of the soil and we were not going to be able to produce ag and food products the way we needed to if we continued to do this. So um, in 1935, well, you know, in 1930s, they actually had the Dust Bowl, and Hugh Hammond Bennett was telling people all this time about all this, what was going to happen. So in um, 1935, Congress said, you know what, Hugh Hammond Bennett, you're right. There is a big major problem, and since you were predicting it and trying to keep us from it, now you're in charge of the agency to take care of it. So we were um, developed in 1935. For years, until 1994, we were called the Soil Conservation Service. Um, that was our main point of, of trying to get to fix all the soil conservation issues. But we found uh, over the years that we kept expanding our scope. Um, we started dealing with water, soil, air, um, you know, a whole multitude of natural resources. So we were renamed in 1994 to the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Basically, our mission is to help ag producers protect their natural resources and feed a growing world. Um, that's important because when we're out working with people on their property, we know that they are trying to achieve something. That they're, they're either trying to make a living off of the land or they're trying to produce food for local communities. There's some, some kind of overall management decision. So we're not there to get in the way of that management. We're there to help protect the resources they have so they can continue doing their own mission. So um, a lot of people, I think, assume that because we're federal, a federal entity that we're regulatory, and I wanna make sure, I hope everyone on this, on this meeting knows that we are not, but we're not gonna be out on people's property doing any of this assistance kind of work unless we're requested to be there. So we're not gonna come out and, and um, in any kind of re regulatory capacity. It's a voluntary type of system that we work with and we are a science-based agency. So we have, um, I go, I'll get into all this later, but we have conservation practice standards that we follow. Those have went through rigorous research and testing for years. Um, we have access to a lot of technical type of disciplines that I'll cover in a few minutes. So we, we're out there helping landowners, we're doing it at their request and we're doing it in a scientific type of a manner, a science-based manner. So basically kind of the simple tagline that, that describes NRCS and what we do is that we help people help the land. And that's, that's our mission and our goal and what we try to do every day. So everything that we do on people's property um, has to be tied to a resource concern and Basically, that's an environmental issue, an ag-related environmental issue with the management side of things. So some things that we do is soil health. You know, I mentioned that that's kind of how we got our start. It's still a huge emphasis in what we do today is to try to, try to keep the soil healthy. That's the backbone of, of everything that we do. Um, if there are water quality issues related to ag, wildlife habitat issues, Quantity issues, it's water quantity issues. It can be too much water or not enough water. So we can help with existing irrigation systems on properties. Um, we can help if there are a lot of flooding, like through croplands and resulting in a lot of erosion, uh, manure management from flooding, um, different kinds of things that we can do. And we also um, can help protect the property from like an easement standpoint. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So if you're working with um, a landowner and you're thinking that NRCS might be a good fit for them, so just know that they, we kind of have two buckets that we do work in, so to speak. And one is that technical assistance piece and one is financial assistance piece. So anytime that NRCS is involved, you know, I mentioned that we're an agency with a lot of technical disciplines and we're founded, you know, within that science kind of research kind of thing. So anytime we're involved, there's gonna be technical assistance. Landowners can choose to request financial assistance. They don't have to. 
So the technical assistance piece is what I'm going to talk about first. And it is basically, it's first of all, it's free of charge. So there's not a cost share component to the technical assistance part. And the, at the end of the technical assistance piece, the landowner is going to have a, what we call a conservation plan. So our staff, we're going to ask those, the landowners to contact our field staff, our local offices, which I'll go into in more depth later. And they're going to go out, they're going to talk with the landowner about their management, any issues that they see, resource concerns that they see, and they're going to give them a plan to kind of say, here's what we see as conservationists, here's the problem areas, um, here's conservation practices that you can implement on that. That local conservationist, if they see something that maybe needs a little more technical expertise, like maybe there's a problem that's a little above what they can do as kind of like general conservationists, they have access to soil scientists, engineers, agronomists, um, all within the state of Kentucky. So I mentioned at the beginning of this that my background is ac actually agriculture engineer. I spent several years as a field engineer um, within RCS working with landowners to design um, Ag waste storage systems or something like that. If if there is an agronomist, if there's a big vegetative or plant issue, there's a state agronomist they can call on. We have archaeologists in case you, you know, maybe in an area where there's some type of cultural resources. So they have access to all those people, and by default, the landowners have access to all those people. So we can hopefully have a fairly comprehensive conservation plan that we can hand that landowner. Um, besides that technical piece, the, the plan is going to include aerial photos of the property. Um, they're going to talk about current management that they're doing and maybe ways they can manage things better to help with some of those resource concerns. They're going to give them um, a list of conservation practices that they recommend, and you can have more than one. Um, you can address multiple resource concerns. There's going to be a soils map um, that talks about the soils on the property. And we'll let them know, you know, what, what the soil is good for, is, or the way that the landowner is managing it. Is it, does it work with the soil type? Do you need to make some adjustments? And then if those conservation practices have any kind of operation and maintenance components to them, they'll talk about that too. And then the landowner gets that plan, it's free of charge, and they can decide, you know, you know what, I, I appreciate all this information. There's pieces, parts I wanna work with. Um, I think I can handle it from now, from here on out, and then we're done. Uh, if they decide, you know what, I do want to implement a lot of these things, but I can't do it financially, then they can go into the next part of what we do, and that's the financial assistance part. So financial assistance, you don't have to do financial assistance. Um, we actually have quite a few landowners across the state that, that just like that technical assistance piece, that conservation plan, and they have the capability and the means to go forward and do what they need to do um, without any financial assistance piece. If you do want financial assistance, um, we have a, a slew of different programs that you can work with. I'm gonna cover the top three that are probably the most common. Um, if we're assisting you, they have, you're gonna be, you have to implement those conservation plans and they have to follow those practice standards. So it's important to let landowners know if you're working with them and they are interested in one of our programs that there are rules and regulations they have to follow for that financial assistance. Any work that we do on properties has to address a resource concern. So that's the number one thing that that conservationist is out there looking at. And that happens during the technical assistance piece, but they um, are seeing if there, is, if there are resource concerns that need to be addressed. Eligible ag land, um, you know, the typical type of ag land that everybody thinks about is eligible. I'll talk a little bit more about eligibility, I think maybe in the next slide. But there's also, a lot of people don't realize that um, non-industrial private forest land is also eligible for NRCS assistance. I think people think the typical crop lands or uh, livestock facilities, that sort of thing is ag, but they're but we do work on forest land as long as it's non-industrial and private. And we do work in urban areas. And a lot of people are often surprised at that. Um, I'll talk a little bit in a minute about the farm serial number that, that landowners need to get from the Farm Service Agency. If they have that farm serial number, they're considered ag. And 
there are a lot of urban areas that have farm serial numbers. Um, in fact, NRCS um, has done a lot of uh, work in urban areas the last probably five to 10 years. And USDA actually just stood up a, a whole new department um, in like 2019 called the Office of Urban Ag in, in Innovative Production. So they're trying, they realize that there's a lot of um, potential in urban areas to do conservation work. So it's not just that typical farm rural landscape that a lot of people talk about. Excuse me, I'm fighting a cold, so I'm gonna cough for a second and grab a drink of water. <coughs> I hope that's not too um, loud with you all. Okay. So um, general eligibility criteria, um, I mentioned this before, but basically um, it's gonna be program dependent. And again, that, that uh, local service center, that field NRCS person is gonna walk the landowner through all this. So if you're working with a landowner and it just seems like it's too much, just please tell them to contact our, our field people and they'll, they'll break it down in manageable chunks. I know um, we are the federal government a lot of forms, there's a lot of hoops and stuff like that, but our, um, our field staff is a very adept at helping people work through that. So general eligibility is basically that you're, you have a social security number or an employee ID number, that the property that you need financial assistance on, that you do own it or you have um, the right to work it. So you can, can show a lease agreement um, or a rental agreement, something like that. The farm serial number I mentioned earlier, that's what you get from the Farm Service Agency. Um, if you're working with NRCS staff and you're in a local service, what we call service center, often we're co-located with the Farm Agent Service Agency. So our staff, even though they start with us, they can get them in touch with FSA people if they do not have that farm serial number. I also wanna point out that the farm serial number is only needed if you want financial assistance. So technical assistance, that conservation plan, it's free of charge. You don't have to have a farm serial number. You don't have to, to show all of this information. This is just for if you want financial assistance under a program. They have to be compliant with highly erodible land um, and wetland conservation um, provisions. If if they're a farmer and they've been farming for a while, they're gonna know if, that, if they are in an area of highly erodible land or if there's a wetland conservation provision. Um, if not, our staff can let them know. And they must meet adjusted gross income provisions. That's currently $900,000 a year. That can change and that's also program dependent. So I just wanted to give you guys an idea of the general provisions. Um, once you get into actual program specifics, our, our local field staff will help you kind of navigate any additional or different eligibility criteria. So I'm just gonna touch briefly on three of the more common um, programs that NRCS has, financial assistance programs. There are more, but these are the ones that people are utilize the most or most familiar with. And the first is the Environmental Quality Incentive Programs or what we call EQIP. Um, again, voluntary financial assistance on ag land. I like to tell people that EQIP is kind of like the fix it program. A lot of people that are really good fits that fit really well with EQIP um, maybe haven't done conservation on their property at all or maybe they're a new farmer, a beginning farmer, and they're not really sure what to do. Um, so EQIP is a really good program to kind of get your foot in the door with NRCS, see what we're about, fix some, some major conservation issues on your property. Um, and then you can come back and ask, you know, landowners can always sign up for more EQIP. Um, you can, if they get funded and they implement some things one year, you know, in a couple of years, they can sign up again and continue to do, to do work with just EQIP. And we have a lot of landowners that do that. The other program I wanna highlight a little bit is the Conservation Stewardship Program. So I call EQIP the Fix-It Program. I call CSP the Reward Program. CSP are um, is people, landowners that are already doing some kind of conservation on their property and they wanna do more. So CSP is gonna give you kind of a reward for the conservation work that you're already doing. 
and it's going to give you some incentive payments to do more to take it to the next level. So equip a lot of people that start out with equip will move into CSP and um, and continue to do work with us in CSP. Excuse me. <coughs> I really apologize for the coughing. The last program I'm going to talk about briefly, and it is a very different type of program, is our Agriculture Conservation Easement Program, or ASEP. And again, all of this is going to start with that local field service center, that local conservation is coming out. But there are a lot of people who just want to protect their property in different ways. And we have an easement um, set of programs that can do that. So the most common one in Kentucky, probably the most well-known one, is the Wetland Easement Program. That's where we're either protecting wetlands that are already on property or we're restoring wetlands that maybe were drained in the past. Um, a farmer has been trying to farm this wet piece of property for years and it's just not working out. So you can put that part in, an, in a wetland easement. Um, there, we have a grassland easement program. We have a healthy forest easement program. Um, we also have a, um, it's more, it's like a development easement program, particularly around the Lexington area, where the farmers, the landowners are just working the farm like they always have, but they just want to protect it from development. And so you basically are just getting compensated for those development rights. So you can't subdivide the farm, you can't put a Walmart on the farm. And so obviously it's more popular around more urban areas like Lexington has quite a few of them. Easements are very, very, very different program. Um, so we actually have a whole entire easement staff that works solely on this stuff with NRCS. And you, the landowners would meet with that local um, conservationist. And then if easement sounds like where they want to head, you know, the direction they need to go in, then that local conservationist will get them in touch with that easement staff that will, that will work with them. We actually have a really robust easement program in the state. Um, and the staff, they do easements all across the state on a regular basis. So they will be in good hands. They just kind of be shifted to another group because of the specialized nature of the easements. So I want to show you briefly, I apologize for the quality of this map. I can't quite get a better, better one yet. I'm working on it. But I wanted to show you kind of how we're divided up, how NRCS is divided up administratively across the state. It's hard to see, but basically we have three areas. Um, so there's the western part of the state, the central part of the state, and the eastern part of the state. And then each area is divided up into four different work units. And if you can tell, there are little stars, like Burlington in Northern Kentucky is, is one of our service centers. The stars represent our service center locations. Those are the bigger offices that usually have a little more staff, um, usually are co-located with farm service agency. Not always, but usually. Um, almost always we're co-located with the local soil and water conservation district. Um, I think in a couple of places, we might actually have extension people in some of the offices across the state. So we have the larger service centers, and then we ha also have not shown on this map what we call program delivery points. And that's an office that's maybe not full-time staffed by NRCS, but it's kind of a touch point in an area that maybe where we don't have a lot of staff close by that, that our people can go and meet with landowners and be, be in that local area. You know, in the southeast part of the state, we have, a, we have less um, service centers, so we, we have, tend to have more of those program delivery points there. So I just wanted to get you, um, give you all an idea of how we're set up. Um, at the end of this, and I think also uh, Jenny and Brooke are going to drop in the chat how to get in touch with our staff. Um, and I have, I also have the URL, URL at the end of it. It's kind of a lengthy one to go to our office locator. So I always just tell people just go to a search engine and type in NRCS Kentucky. There's a contact us tab that you can type in the county that the land is in, and it will bring up, you know, um, the service center address, phone number, and an email of, of the staff that's there. So it actually gives you staff name and contact information. So I always recommend that people try that method. So I'm going to briefly go over steps to assistance. You know, I've talked about some of this already, but 
Uh, the first part is the planning part. That's that conservation plan. That's that technical assistance piece. That's the one that's, that's free. There's no kind of cost share component to that. It all starts with visiting that local service center, which is why I say it probably 75 times in this, in this presentation. Please, please get any landowner that you're working with in touch with that local staff. Um, if they do work with us, um, over the years, they often develop a very close relationship with that field staff, and it's really interesting uh, to see that. I tell people that we're a federal agency, but because of how we have our office structure set up, we have a local flavor. So um, a lot of times we have staff that have, that have worked with farmers for 15, 20 years, their whole career. Um, and it's just a very different dynamic than what you get with most federal agencies. So contact them to get that plan started. That's what we're going to ask you to tell landowners that might be a good fit for NRCS. If they decide they want to do financial assistance, that local staff is going to take them through that application process. Um, then they're, we're going to determine eligibility. So that's, you know, I threw up that slide a few minutes ago about general eligibility. When you put in the application, you're going to be, you're going to know what program you're applying for, you're going to know more, they're going to know um, more to find what the eligibility is, that local conservation staff is going to go through all that with them. And then there's going to be a ranking of our applications. So I will say that we have way more applications than we have funding for. So it is competitive. Um, I don't want anyone to think that just because they put in an application, it's automatic kind of funding. So we do pause, you can put in an application at any time. So a landowner can go into a service center, start that process, they can apply at any time. We will pause that application process to rank, to kind of batch up applications and rank them uh, because we have limited funding. We wanna make sure the, the federal financial assistance is going to the properties that are gonna be fixing the most issues. And then if they get funded, then there's an implementation phase. That's when they're gonna have to follow those conservation practice standards. Our staff will be available to assist them through that. Depending on what they're implementing, our staff may be out there with them as they're implementing it. Um, but there's, they're gonna be checking in to make sure that it's being implemented correctly to address any kind of questions that the landowner may have. So really when you're working within RCS, if they do financial assistance and they get funded, they're really going to have assistance from us from the very beginning to the very end to the implementation phase. So I've talked a lot about conservation practice standards and um, how we have to follow those if, if a landowner gets financial assistance. Um, depending on what the standard is, it's, it's a multi-page document. It's going to contain information on um, why the practice is needed, the areas it needs to be applied, minimum criteria to achieve the purpose to fix that resource concern or concerns that it's addressing. Um, these practice standards are, are a result of all of that research that I talked about earlier, you know, all the trial and error and research. So you're, um, you have these practice standards, they're developed nationally, and then each state takes them and um, tweaks them, makes them applicable to the state because every state has different rule, rules and regulations within the state. The practice standards are either agronomic in nature or engineering in nature. That's the two big buckets. So um, in Kentucky, we have a state conservation engineer that takes all those engineering practice standards, makes sure it meets our standards and then any kind of state standards. And then we have a state resource conservationist and a state agronomist. That, that does the same for the agronomic practices. And um, I'm gonna talk about some of our most popular conservation practices in just a second, but just know that there's well over 150 practice standards to pull from to address different con uh, resource concerns in different settings. Um, I actually looked the other day, I think there's like 169, but um, we have a lot that we can choose from. So just know that the ones that I'm getting ready to cover are by no means all that we have. I just wanna go over some of the common ones that we use in the state. And that way, if you're working with someone and it looks like they need one of these, then you can send them our way and see if, if it's something that we can eventually work 
um, get funded to work for, uh, work in on their property. <laughs> so our most common standard or applied standard is always either fencing or cover crops. They kind of go back and forth um, each year. Um, I'm gonna talk about cover crops in just a second. But fencing is something that we do quite a bit. It's also a good example of um, kind of the standards that we're gonna we're gonna require. If you're if we're paying to do a fence on a person's property, we want it supposed to be a certain size, um, the wiring to be a certain kind, you know, a certain gauge, it to be spaced a certain way, that sort of thing. We do fencing for a multitude of reasons. Um, rotational grazing, if you have a landowner you're working with that has, um, you know, a livestock grazing system and maybe they're having issues with that keeping vegetation is too heavily grazed or something, we can set up ro rotational grazing. Um, if, there, if there's a water quality issue um, because livestock is watering in a creek or a pond or a river, or something like that, you can fence them out of the river or that water body. Um, we can fence them out of woodlands. If they're destroying, you know, forest land on someone's property, we can fence them out of that to facilitate a healthy forest. So it's just an example of a few of the resource concerns that we can address with fencing. Kind of a companion practice, doesn't have to be with fencing, but they often go hand in hand, are um, livestock watering facility and pipelines. So obviously, if we're doing rotational grazing paddocks, that livestock needs water. So we can, um, NRCS can help cost share on this, uh, this system. If you're fencing your livestock out of a water body, they need water. So we can help with that. Um, this will help with sediment and erosion. It helps with livestock health. You know, a lot of, a lot of things that uh, water does. Cover crops I mentioned is usually our top one or two uh, practice that we use and basically um, that's keeping some kind of cover on on that cropland at all times. So, you know, I started this whole presentation talking about the dust bowl and how the whole problem about that was open barren land and if and that particularly was wind, massive wind erosion. But if you keep something on that on that um, cropland at all times, it just everything's just going to be better. The, the soil health is going to be better. It's going to be more moist. You're not going to dry it out. It's going to you're gonna trap nutrients on that property, on in that field, you're gonna keep runoff, you know, things from running, running off downstream. Um, so cover crops is a really big uh, practice standard that we utilize. Forest stand improvement, we have a conservation practice that's called forest stand improvement. We do a lot of that across the state, uh, more in the Eastern part because we do have more forest land there. It improves wildlife habitat, you know, basically, Forest stand improvement is getting rid of what they call trash trees and keeping the good trees. So increasing water to the healthy trees, reducing damage from storms, from wildfires, uh, pests and disease. So we do a, do a lot of forest stand improvement work across the state. Um, high tunnels, this pro, uh, practice, you know, we've only been doing high tunnels, I can't remember, maybe the last 10 years or so. And every year it just gets more and more popular. So this is a really competitive type of practice. Uh, always have huge demand for high tunnels and it's always increasing. You know, um, one of the things that NRCS wants to work on assisting with is uh, providing um, consumers with a local source of fresh produce. We have multiple projects across the state where we try to focus on food deserts and high tunnels are integral to those type of projects. Um, so these extend the growing season, super popular with any kind of grower or producer that wants to do uh, farm to table type stuff locally or, you know, uh, do their local farmers markets. You're you can, you know, you have a very controlled system. So it improves your plant quality. You can control the soil quality better. You have reduction in pesticides that's needed. You know, there's a variety of things that, that the high tunnels um, address. I do want to point out, so just in case you're happen to happen to talk to someone and they're talking about greenhouses and, you, and you're thinking greenhouse, a high tunnel is a greenhouse, and they are very similar, but there are key differences. So I just want to touch base on that. For us, for high tunnels, the plants have to be in the natural soil profile. 
So if you look at the, it's a picture that's on the screen now, you can see that everything's planted in that natural soil profile. There's no raised beds, there's no hanging baskets. So just keep that in mind. Um, they're very popular, people who use them, you know, really enjoy them. Sometimes it takes a, a little bit of management to figure out how to tweak, tweak how to do things, but they are a little bit different than, than uh, greenhouses. So just wanted to let everybody know that. The last practice standard I'm gonna to touch on, just to kind of show you, you know, we can do bigger things and we can do smaller things. Um, and there's quite a wide variety. Of, you know, we also do pollinator habitat. That's something that we will cost share on. You know, if you're in the ag world at all, and hopefully not in the ag world, you're, you're um, being educated on how important pollinators are to our whole entire society. And so NRCS recognizes that and it's something that we try to address. Uh, often we do pollinator habitat as a companion practice with a lot of different things, other practices. You know, I mentioned that you could do multiple ones. So for example, a lot of people that have high tunnels will put pollinator habitat beside their high tunnels. So it, you know, you can roll up the sides of those high tunnels and it will encourage, you know, cross pollination. And, and so for example, that's just one example. But, um, Pollinator habitat also offers other um, benefits that some people don't really think about. You know, it is kind of like a cover crop. You know, it provides cover. It reduces soil erosion. It provides wildlife food and cover. There are uh, certain birds that nest in this and lay eggs. So um, a lot of benefits to pollinator habitat and pretty low cost conservation practice that people can implement. I'm just going to briefly show you, you know, we talked about some of the most common practices that we implement. And I just kind of want to give you a snapshot of on an annual basis what NRCS accomplishes with these practices. Now, this is financial assistance dollars. It's not that technical assistance piece, that conservation plan. But every, and this is just an average, you know, I looked at the last probably five or six years and kind of just took some big, some averages. It all obviously depends on how much funding we get from um, Congress and that sort of thing. But on average, we get about $30 million in Kentucky to put conservation on the ground. That's a lot of money every year. So $30 million, what does that do for, for the state? Um, usually we'll, we'll, we will um, restore or enhance or create 3,500 acres of wetlands. Um, wetlands is our most popular easement program. Uh, we will install about 200 miles of fence. We will fund about 120 high tunnels. We'll put about 80 miles of pipeline uh, to watering troughs or facilities, or, and we'll help protect and improve about 200 acres of forest land. So I just want to let you guys know kind of where that money goes, and kind of what amounts of money that we're talking about when we're talking about NRCS and conservation practices. A couple of notes, um, I've touched on all of these, but I wanna just reiterate them. Our programs are voluntary, but there are rules that, that landowners have to follow. Um, we do have instances where landowners get approved in programs, they get financial assistance, and they go out and install whatever they install, and it does not meet our our plans and specifications and that's a big problem because the requirement for us so if you're working with someone just let them know there are rules and regulations for that funding they have to follow those standards and specifications the fun, the programs are competitive um, i mentioned earlier that you know we have way more requests than we have funding for i think on average again it changes and it depends on the program but on average, we will fund 30 to 40% of our applications. So uh, very competitive and they, and they need to understand that. And there is a cost share component to the financial assistance piece. Technical assistance is free. Financial assistance, um, there is a cost share and it kind of varies per program. So for like EQIP and CSP, like a practice standard is paid on different rates. So a high tunnel, for example, is paid so much per square foot. A uh, fence is paid so much per linear foot. Cover crops is so much per acre. Obviously, if you get into something like easements, where you're talking about land acquisition, you know, 
kind of stuff. It's a very different type of cost share. So they need to understand that um, that there is a cost share component. Generally, for the the EQIP and CSP type programs, a good rule of thumb is 75% federal, 25% landowner. So just to give them an idea of what they're looking for, the cost is going to be very dependent on what they, um, you know, what their their ag land looks like and what they're going to be implementing. But that's a good rule of thumb to go into, you know, if you're talking to someone. Um, I do want to take a few minutes and talk about historically underserved applicants because their cost share rates can be different. So historically underserved applicants, NRCS gives special program considerations to these groups. I'll talk about what those groups are in just a second. But one of the special considerations is a higher payment rate. Again, depends on the program, depends on the practice. But generally speaking, um, if they're historically underserved, they're going to get about 90% federal, 10% um, landowner. So a big, a big difference. They also tend or can compete in smaller pools of funding. So they may be just be competing against other historically served applications. Um, that local conservationist can talk to you about the funding pools and how that's implemented for historically underserved applicants because it's different to the different programs. So um, they can, they just, if they are historically underserved, just know that they might be competing in a smaller group. So their chances of getting funded are higher. And also, you know, even a lot of these historically underserved groups, you know, they may have trouble even meeting that 10% cost share or whatever their cost share rate may be. And they're eligible for advanced partial payments if needed. So that's the kind of the three big special program considerations that historically underserved groups get from NRCS if they're funded for financial assistance. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're a farm bill oriented, you know, we have farm bill programs. We're currently under uh, operating under the 2018 farm bill. Farm bills are redone every four years. And um, usually in each farm bill, they reiterate who is, what groups are considered historically underserved. So. Right now, there's three categories, uh, beginning farmers. So if they haven't farmed consecutively for the past 10 years, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. Um, they just have to show a tax return where they did not schedule or file that Schedule F sometime in the last 10 years, and they are eligible for beginning farmer historically underserved um, status. Limited resource producers. Um, family income doesn't exceed a certain level. So again, those local uh, service centers will know the specifics of what those levels may be. And then socially disadvantaged groups, which are groups like American Indians, Alaskan Natives, Asians, Black, African Americans, um, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, Hispanics. Um, if they fall into any of those categories, and that's a self-certification kind of thing, there's no proof needed for those. Uh, they were they are considered historically underserved and will get those special consider program considerations. And if you're dealing with someone who may fit into one of these categories, what you tell them is always we're going to do that technical assistance piece at no cost. If they want to do financial assistance and they fill out the application, there are boxes on that application that they check for whichever group or any group that they qualify for. So it's feasible that they could have all three. And that local uh, conservationist is going to kind of, you know, can kind of tell them the funding pools and the cost share. They know more on, on the specifics on that. But that's how they let us know um, in the application process what they kind of fall, what groups they may fall into. And then we will take that application and, and manage it appropriately from there. So almost done. I just want to clear up. I mentioned all of this during my, my presentation, but some common misconceptions of when people are working with NRCS or hear about NRCS if they haven't worked with us before. One is um, that NRCS only takes applications at certain times of the year and we take applications continuously. I think the confusion is when we take those breaks and batch them. So someone may put in an application and it may be several months before they hear if they ranked well or got funded, but they they can go in at any time and fill out an application for any program. People often think we're regulatory. I've mentioned several times that we are not. 
people think that we do not do work in urban areas and we do. Uh, tiny, uh, technical and financial assistance are available to the to any urban areas. Um, so don't hesitate to send those type, you know, urban kind of producers to us. And people think that forests are not eligible and they are. We actually do quite a bit of forest work in the state. And it's actually one of the things that our state conservationist is trying to increase, um, especially because in Eastern Kentucky, we are so heavily forested. We're trying to increase the number of uh, applications that we get on forest land. And with that, that is my presentation. Here are those URLs that I mentioned. I think um, Jenny or Brooke, Brooke is gonna be putting them in the chat as well. The top one is how to, how to contact our service centers. Um, as I mentioned, you just put in the county and then it will give you a person's name and their work address, an email address and a phone number. If you want just Kentucky NRCS program information, uh, that's the next URL. And then we have a relatively new uh, farmers.gov website. It's USDA wide. Um, if I have on here forward slash conservation, but, um, and that's gonna take you, it's gonna tell you why in USDA pro, uh, USDA agencies do conservation work. So NRCS is the, one of the main ones, but there, there are other agencies that do conservation type work with landowners. Farm Service Agency, for example, has a program or two that they can do with, with landowners that's conservation oriented. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Cindy or Brooke. I'm not sure he's doing it. Yeah, um, we have some great questions for you um, in the chat. Okay. So for folks with us on the line, we have another 10 minutes here. So go ahead and drop any of your questions in there um, and, and we'll get to them. So I'll just sort of start at the top. Um, Lori was asking, uh, she's interested to hear more about options for farmers on lease land and what's possible or not possible in that situation. On what land? I'm sorry. Leased land. Are there any Lease special land? considerations for farmers that are on leased land? Um, I don't think there are any special considerations. So I will say, if there are any questions that I can't answer, I will note it and try to um, get back with Brooke and so you all can get the answers because sometimes I get very wide range of questions and I don't know all the answers. I don't, there's not, to my knowledge, there's not special consideration for anybody who leases land, they're, but they're eligible for any of our programs just like anyone who owns the land. So they just have to show, if they do financial assistance, they just have to show that they have that lease and everything flows through them just like they were the owner. I hope that answers that. Yeah, great. Um, and regarding easements, are easements permanent? What, what's the fine print on the easements that should be considered? Um, most, I, I'll, I'll follow up on this to be sure, but most of our easements are permanent. Um, I think at one point we did have like a 30 year option, but I don't know if that's currently available. That may be something that, that kind of went away. So I will follow up on that with our easement specialist and let you know. And that would carry over if the land was sold, correct? Yes, yes. The easements go on the title. Um, so if they sell the land, it goes with the land. Okay. Um, are field offices currently open for walk-in visits or should um, farmers schedule an appointment in advance? Schedule an appointment. Um, it depends on the area so, and it's always changing because of COVID and COVID numbers. So um, at one point when Kentucky numbers were low, they were open to limited, um, uh, or limited people could come in, but it was all by appointment. So the best thing to do is to contact or email them and they, we are operating as normal, but sometimes if you're in a really high transmission area, they're gonna meet you outside in the parking lot or something outdoors, but it's appointment only for the most part right now. And we dropped the, uh, the link to where folks can find their local service center um, in the chat a number of times. We'll send that out again. It's a great resource. And we, we, I know at Oak, we send it to farmers all the time, referring folks yeah. to, to get in touch with their local yeah. service center. So. Um, it's a great resource. Um, so um, specific questions about some of the programs um, and fencing, can the fencing program be used to exclude deer from produce production areas? 
Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever heard that question. I will follow up on that as well. We got a lot of folks on the line working with, uh, you know, vegetable growers. Uh, all in yeah. The, the ongoing challenge of deer exclusion is real. Yeah. Um, I mean, it all ties back to, it has to address a resource concern. Mm -hmm. And you would think plant health, <laughs> you would think that that's, but I'm not sure. I'll have to check. Okay. Um, and then uh, another question uh, specific uh, from Bethany, any cover crop help for plasticulture production? Like in between rows specifically is where some bad erosion can occur there. So thinking about, um, you know, cover crop in the pathways. Right, I think cover crop can be used all over. I mean, I think that we would recommend widespread coverage of the entire cropland. Um, I don't know if we would just specifically do in between the rows, uh, you know, like maybe while the crop is on, I'm guessing she's thinking, yeah. um, I can check on that too. Okay. Um, and then thinking just a little more broadly about um, the Kentucky specific practice stand standards, we know that they're available online. Um, I was thinking, is that, is that an okay link to share with everyone just so we can, everyone can see the practice standards all at once there. It's, yeah. it's useful for us, I know, when we're working with farmers and making referrals. So, um, yeah. so Jenny, yeah. go ahead. I mean, certainly do that. Just don't be overwhelmed. I guess I'll just say that because there are so many when you get in there and you kind of have to know what you're looking for, but yeah, share it. And then if they have any questions, they can contact like me or someone else and we can maybe direct them. Cause I think they're organized by number and it's kind of not. There's a lot of, there's a lot of info there, but if anyone's yeah. curious, it was useful for us to sort of go through and look and see what's available. Um, yeah. If anyone's curious for more info, um, that's great. And then um, thinking about um, some of the specifics of financial assistance in general, um, you mentioned, you know, you talked a lot about how the cost share rate varies per program, and you talked about the historically underserved applicants um, and the opportunities there, which is wonderful. Um, are the I guess I'm um, thinking about it's a more of a reimbursement model, right? Um, the farmer has mm -hmm. to submit um, proof of payment um, and then they're reimbursed at the rate that's agreed upon. Um, and are there payment limits? Like you talked about the percentage, right? Is, is typically a reimbursement percentage is how some of the programs operate, but are there upper limits that vary by program? Um, well, first, um, it's reimbursement unless you're historically underserved and you can potentially get advanced payments. Mm -hmm. So that's a big, a big caveat to that. Um, but general, generally it is reimbursement. The payment limits are gonna be, so when we're working with landowners and we're designing or you know, coming up with these practice standards, we're gonna tell them the payment limits. So high tunnels, for example, we're gonna say you need, this is, we've got, you know, a 200 square foot high tunnel planned for you. The maximum cost share rate is this. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to be that maximum part. And that's why I said, yeah, I, I was very careful. And I try to tell people that 75%, 25% is average. But in, in high tunnels specifically, um, depending on where they are built, um, particularly in urban areas, the installation costs might be more because they're more difficult to get into. And so sometimes that's an issue with us um, because we have that maximum square footage rate. That's what we're going to pay. And then because, just because of the dynamics of the area, it, the cost per square footage might be a little bit more. So if you have a smaller high tunnel too, sometimes this come in, comes into play. So right now um, we're kind of stuck at that cost share rate. So, I mean, landowners know that going in. They know that this is the amount that I'm going to get. And some of them are able to, to do things to kind of manage that. Um, we're trying to work through as an agency, those special circumstances, particularly in urban areas where the cost share rate might need to be a little bit, or the square footage rate um, might need to be a little bit higher because of those specific site constraints. Mm -hmm. but, but basically part of that, uh, if they get funded financial, for financial assistance, they're gonna get a contract 
it's going to tell them how much the maximum payment is going to be for each practice. Great. Um, so um, I, I think a lot of us working with farmers hear from producers that don't have equip applications funded um, and, and sort of some of the frustrations there. And so we can, of course, help out setting those expectations, right? That that uh, mm -hmm. you know, 30 to 40 percent of applicants get funded. But what advice would you share with us who are working with farmers about um, how those farmers might improve their applications or find out, you know, the details of how their proposal was scored, um, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So um, all of our programs have a rank have ranking questions and criteria, and those are not a secret. So you can look, and they and they're dependent on you know equip stuff has ranking criteria, CSP stuff has ranking criteria. So when you're working with that local service center person, ask to see what those ranking questions are. Um, sometimes if they're willing, if you're gonna address, if you're able and willing to address multiple resource concerns, those tend to rank higher. Um, if it's in an area that has been designated like a special initiative area or something, um, where like maybe water quality is a really big concern, then they might have ranking questions that put those water quality applications more at the top. So there's not really like a, a catch all answer to that because it's very dependent on the program, the area that you're in, if you're in any kind of, um, you know, different funding pools, that local conservationist will know all of that and can give you that information. For EQIP, I think the ranking questions might even be on our Kentucky website, maybe. I know they are for RCPP, but I'm not sure about general equip. So that's how they're gonna be ranked. So if a landowner can look at that and say, you know what, I can do this, or you know, some of it they have control over and some of it they don't, that will improve their chances, if that makes Great. sense. Yeah. I just wanna um, take a quick time check. We're at 11 o'clock and in these Zoom days, I know people are back to back sometimes. So I just wanna acknowledge that Please, if you're still with us, which most of you are, um, take a very quick moment to um, complete this short survey. Um, we wanna hear from you and please, please, please include any recommendations for future trainings that we can put together for y'all. Um, drop them in the chat or add it to the survey there. So um, we do have just a, a couple more questions to get to if uh, for folks who have the flexibility, hang with us for five more minutes. Um, so um, pretty specific question. Um, in regards to the cost share amounts, um, do they reflect any increases in material costs due to pandemic related shortages? Is that sort of um, a consideration in the next year? Um, so? they, well, I'm not sure about the next year. Currently, because we, we're working on um, contract people implementing stuff that was done pre-COVID and now they're implementing and things are a lot higher. Um, we were allowed a special, I can't remember, the acronym is CARP, which it sticks in your brain, but, but it's basically coronavirus assistance something payments, and it's to get an increased um, rate because of the increased cost of materials. Um, it's a little, getting into the weeds a little bit, but every year we do, we look at our um, material costs and we will update them. A lot of years have come just to pass through because there's not a lot of, of change. So I anticipate from now forward, we'll either be doing this, this CARP assistance payment because of coronavirus, or we'll be adjusting our payment schedules where those will go up. And those are done regionally. So we're in a region with like Kentucky, West Virginia, um, Virginia maybe, and they'll look at the cost of those materials and try to adjust those. So, but there are avenues that either through that adjustment, just in general, or through this um, coronavirus assistance payment program that we have. Great. Um, and are the programs considered income? So meaning if growers need to, do they need to claim it on their taxes? I don't know that question. Gosh, you all have such good questions. I will check <laughs> on that. And is there a lifetime cap on equipped? Um, I'll check on that too. I think there used to be, I don't know if there still is, but I'll check on that too. Okay. Um, 
And then just broadly, because we're all advocates here and we um, really appreciate all of these the $30 million in annual funding that NRCS brings to farmers. Can you share um, how that amount is determined, um, what, that's, what that is based on um, each year? Um, well, I can tell you. Like how does, how does USDA <laughs> allocate that amount of resources to Kentucky? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, so I'm jotting down these questions, I'm sorry. Um, there is this magical formula that no one can quite ever figure out. But basically what happens is every year, um, NRCS is kind of lucky in that we're farm bill, you know, like equip CSP, that's all farm bill programs. So each farm bill has the funding amount nationally um, for each year. There's some adjustments up and down. So 2018 farm bill kind of let us know what to expect for the next four years nationally. What they do in Kentucky or nationally within RCS is they will take, they'll look at all the money that we did last year. So how good did you do? Did you have too much money in some of our, in the programs? Did you return a bunch of stuff back to headquarters, that sort of thing? And then we also will look at, um, there's kind of like a, a looking into need. So if we're trying to do a lot more easements, are there areas that we can maybe focus that? Maybe we'll, they'll give us some extra money for, for that. Um, they track a lot of a lot of this stuff in all these databases that we have to have. So they kind of it's kind of a mismatch. Mis I don't know. It, we never can quite figure it out. Sometimes you know we we spend a lot of time and effort saying how can we get that number up, and we think we'll do it, and then it doesn't quite work. Um, but they have a national formula to plug all this stuff into. I do know that a lot of it is contingent on not returning any funds because the, I guess the general consensus nationally is this, well, you didn't need it last year. So we work really hard to obligate every penny that we have. So we'll get that much and more hopefully the next year, but it's, it's very hard to predict. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate everything y'all do. Um, the state office and obviously in all the service centers um, getting the support out to farmers. So thank you. Thank you for being here with us today, sharing all the, the information. Um, and thanks for answering all these questions. <laughs> um, we'll yeah, be sure to, yeah. to, to follow up with everyone with the recording and any additional resources and lots of links. So um, please keep an eye on your mm -hmm. email for that. Thanks to um, for tuning in today and please leave your feedback. Just one last request, leave your feedback on that short survey Jenny just dropped in the link. It helps us um, plan for the future and um, learn about what you found valuable in this time together. Um, so also, um, you know, this, this is the first part in a series of trainings that we'll be offering. So um, please keep an eye out for the next uh, opportunity to tune in. Um, we're looking at some virtual farm tours and um, additional webinars, um, both, both live, um, you know, virtually live, but also asynchronous options. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and if you have any um, brainstorm ideas about topics you would love to hear more information about, drop it in the chat. Um, shoot Cindy an email, reach out to Josh, reach out to me or Jenny, um, and we'll be sure to get it on the, the planning agenda. But we are looking at a virtual farm tour at the, um, the UK Horticultural Research Organic Unit in the December, um, and thinking about a community of practice conversation around IPM strategies um, in early 2022, um, as well as some basic um, sustainability practices to consider in horticulture production. So, um, so lots to come. Please stay tuned. Thank you for being here today. Anything else, Cindy or Josh, that I should we should mention before we part ways? No, what a great program. Thank you so much, Sonia. Yeah, thank you so much. Nothing else comes to mind. I think we're good. All right. Well, thanks for having me. And I'll try to get those questions answered and to you all and you, you can disseminate to the group. <laughs>